The Presidencies of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. We've been talking a good bit about the three Virginians who, for a period of 24 years, held the office of Chief Executive from 1801 until 1825. However, though we've covered so much already, there's always more to learn. And thus, a special guest is joining us to explore this period of American presidential history and discuss what he's learned in the course of researching these three individuals and their respective administrations of how their leadership impacted the course of U.S. history. Kevin R.C. Gutzman is professor of history at Western Connecticut State University and a faculty member at libertyclassroom.com. He has his law degree from the University of Texas Law School and his Ph.D. in American History from the University of Virginia. His books include Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, James Madison and the Making of America, Virginia's American Revolution, and With Thomas Woods, Who Killed the Constitution. His latest book, The Jeffersonians, The Visionary Presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, was published in December 2022 and forms the basis of our conversation. Without further ado, after these messages, we'll transition into our conversation. The Battle of Waterloo was one of the most famous turning points in world history. But what happened next? My name's David Montgomery, and I'm the host of The Siecla, a history podcast that tackles exactly that. Join me as I cover France's overlooked century in between Napoleon and World War I. The Siecle, spelled S-I-E-C-L-E, is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and can be found wherever you get podcasts. So, Kevin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us here on Presidencies today. Happy to be here. We are so glad to talk with you. You know, we've been on Presidencies, delving into the Jeffersonian presidents. You know, we've gone through Jefferson. We are in the midst of Madison, and we know Monroe is looming. It's forthcoming for our listeners, but I was just fascinated with your book, The Jeffersonians, because you take that approach of looking at all of them together and trying to determine what this period of American history of the early Republic, what the significance was for these three Virginia presidents to come one right after the other. And so just to get us started, I was wondering if you could share with our listeners kind of what your motivation was for writing the Jeffersonians and thinking of them as kind of this holistic Jeffersonians presidencies. Well, my book two before this one was called James Madison and the Making of America. I had the Pulitzer winning historian Daniel Walker Howe write me a cover blurb. And when he sent me the blurb, he said, you know, I liked your book quite well, but I wish you'd devoted more attention to Madison's presidency. Madison's presidency wasn't the subject. In fact, I didn't really talk about it that much, except insofar as it intersected with his career as constitution maker. But when I finished my immediate preceding book, Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, I started thinking about, well, okay, what about the idea of a project on Madison's presidency? And you don't have to think about Madison's presidency very long before you realize it's actually kind of a continuation of Jefferson's presidency. It's got the same two leading figures other than Jefferson, that is Madison and Gallatin. And uh, the program is identical. And so when I started thinking, okay, well, maybe I should make a foray into the huge literature of these two administrations, it it didn't take long to realize just as they were continuous, so Monroe's congressional majorities and people in his cabinet thought they too were acting on the same program, which had been laid out by Jefferson in his first inaugural address. I tell my undergraduates, That's one of three or four in American history that are actually worth reading. And what what Jefferson did in his first inaugural address, of course, he could not possibly know that. But what he did was he was laying out the program they'd be following for six terms. They and their cabinets and the majorities in Congress would have essentially the same goals. They implemented 
basically the entire thing. Some of it was a spectacular success. Some of it was a gigantic debacle. And so I told the whole story. That That's the idea. Absolutely. And it is fascinating, that continuum of, you know, from that first inaugural address of Jefferson's on through when you get to the JQA presidency and that really does seem to start to shift things. And we see in this time period that there is this definite shift from what was started, you know, the Washington and Adams presidencies, you see this shift in the nation's politics and the fact that these three figures loom large over that. And, you know, Madison and Madison's presidency, of course, you know, is a fascination for me. It's been so interesting to dive in and so much focus is on the War of 1812, of course, because that is one of the big events of his presidency it looms over it but there's so much more and especially thinking of how it fits into the larger legacy of madison right and so kind of taking us into madison you know you wrote early on in the jeffersonians that quote though often called the father of the constitution madison in fact had a sharply limited impact on the document's final form And you cite how 40 of 71 recorded votes in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia did not go his way. And so, you know, that's one of the what's seen as kind of the big thing in Madison's legacy. But, you know, even Madison himself called the final document, quote, the work of many heads and many hands. So in your research on Madison, would you mind speaking to how you think his work with regards to the crafting and ratification of the U.S. Constitution fits into Madison's overall legacy? Well, it's, of course, the most important thing about his his career. The fact that his influence on the form the Constitution took is often, I might even say usually, overstated does not mean that it wasn't very significant. He was, I think, the person most responsible for the fact that there was a Philadelphia convention. And then the fact that he was successful, he wasn't the only one involved, but he was successful in persuading Washington to attend meant that the Philadelphia convention would have a chance of eliciting support from Congress and then getting the states to ratify the Constitution. That was probably the primary part that he played. Although, of course, people who are familiar with the Philadelphia Convention know that much of the time in the Philadelphia Convention was spent discussing what's called the Virginia Plan. It's actually mostly Madison's plan. And the reason why I make the point that, as he said, quoting Madison, the Constitution was the work of many heads and many hands is because Many of the main features Madison wanted in the Constitution were not included, and that included what he called his favorite feature, which was a congressional veto over all state laws. Right? He tried and tried to have that adopted. That finally, in the last week of the Philadelphia Convention, he proposed it a final time, and every state, including Virginia, voted no. The vote was 10 to 0. So I don't think it's helpful to exaggerate his role, but his role was primary. There's no doubt about that. And it's hard to conceive either the Constitution or the Constitution having been agreed, the Bill of Rights, taking anything like the form that it did without Madison's leading the way in that regard. And of course, again, you couldn't have had a, anything like the Philadelphia Convention's success without Washington's attendance. And so Madison's role here was very important. This is nothing new, of course. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, and it's interesting. It seems like that's, and and that's something that I found, you know, diving into the Madison presidency. I think part of the reason why Madison doesn't always get as much attention, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. It really seems like so much of his work is kind of behind the scenes in making things happen. And that's not, necessarily as glamorous, it, you know, of being called the father of the Constitution, but it's also key. You know, he played key roles in, in these pivotal moments in American history. 
Well, yes, he's a very important person, obviously. And his work, his important work was chiefly constitutional, whether it's as the youngest person in the convention that wrote Virginia's first state constitution, the first written constitution adopted by the people's representatives in the history of the world. Madison was 25 years old and played a prominent role in writing that thing, writing the Virginia Declaration of Rights, the first American Declaration of Rights, the whole project of having written constitutions that were popularly ratified is kind of hard to, uh, it's hard to tease out in one's mind without Madison's having been involved in it. So that's why, as I said before, I, I wrote a book about Madison's career as constitution maker, which I think is very important. But one reason why I wrote the book was that I thought his role had been exaggerated, at least in the popular understanding at, at several junctures. And so it needed to be the record needed to be corrected. Absolutely. And it's a different role than some of the other leaders played, but it's also just such a key role and it's complex. And that's part of the, for me, part of the fascination about Madison is trying to really comprehend and grasp his role in these various points in his career. And even in his presidency, you still see some of that kind of shaping behind the scenes, making things happen. Sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't, but, you know, he was still there and, and having that influence. And so it's just, it's, he's a fascinating figure to me. Well, we agree. <laughs> well, and so kind of taking us back to the Jeffersonians, thinking of all three of these presidents, you wrote in your book about how during Jefferson's tenure, appointment issues were a constant quote, swelling to dominant volume from time to time and otherwise always humming along in the background. And, you know, this is one of those things that really does carry over their presidencies. And ultimately, as the 19th century went on, the growth of the spoil system would ultimately be countered by the push for civil reform. But would you mind speaking to the role that the appointment power played in the presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe? Well, one, one point that Jefferson establishes early on in his administ administration is he does not want anything like what we now think of as a spoil system, which is a term I associate with uh, the second American party system's practice of when a new party took control of the White House, sweeping out all the appointed officers, firing every postmaster in the country, uh, you know, getting rid of all the tax collectors in the ports and bringing in new people associated with the president's party. Jefferson was not going to do that. So there's a, an instance described in the book in which Jefferson got a letter signed by numerous wealthy merchants from New Haven, Connecticut, and they were complaining about the fact that Jefferson had appointed a new um, federal functionary for their city, which is the port city in Connecticut, right near New York City. And they said this fellow, unlike his father, whom he succeeded, um, is not fit for this job. He's not held in respect. He doesn't have the aptitude for it and so on. So Jefferson wrote back and said, well, you know, you've, this fellow is a city judge and you just chose him to be your state rep again. And do you really think he's a total loser? It doesn't even make sense. But then he went on to explain that people couldn't expect now that the Republicans had control of the federal executive for the first time, that the entire appointed roster of uh, federal officials would continue to be entirely federalist. That, that he said, when I came into office, everybody in an appointed job was a federalist. And obviously this isn't what the people want because they just gave the Republicans control of both houses of Congress and the executive. And he said, I'm not going to get rid of every federalist but we're certainly going to have at least proportionate share of people in the uh, appointed positions who represent the people's preferred uh, party. And he said, I'm not going to get rid of all the Federalists. If one has the impression that what he meant was if the ratio in the voting was 60-40, then he thought 60% of appointed officials should be Republicans. But the Federalists in New Haven, who were, of course, also used to running the politics of Connecticut and the church in Connecticut and the, the college, Yale in Connecticut, they thought that they should continue to decide who would be their local 
federal tax collector. So Jefferson issued this statement. It might seem to be trivial in itself that he had this run-in with the Connecticut, with the New Haven merchants, but this is an example of his issuing a statement of, it's partly policy, but partly of philosophical belief and hoping that his explanation would persuade people beyond the audience he was immediately addressing. Obviously, he didn't think he was going to persuade all these nabobs in New Haven that they should get ready for a lot of Republican appointees, but he thought the population generally will probably find this persuasive. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to him that everybody in the federal government should be a federalist when the people had just voted against the federalists. And of course, by the end of the book, in 1820, when James Monroe is reelected, he got all but one electoral vote. And the one elector who voted against him was a Republican who just didn't like his personality, he said. So what this meant was that the Federalist Party had basically ceased to exist. And that, of course, was coming to fruition of the hopes of Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and all their supporters. But it was uh, a development that was unique in American history. And even during Reconstruction, we still had Democrats being elected in the North to be in Congress, right? We, we've never had another instance where one of the major parties just disappeared, but that's what happened during this period. Absolutely. And and it's interesting because then you start to see kind of the inner party factionalism starting to develop. And, and you, right. you do see, I think with all three of the presidents, this pressure, oh, well, appoint this person over this person. And Ultimately, you know, you do have other parties kind of spinning off from this, but those tensions are just constantly there of the appointment. You're not going to be able to make everybody happy. And I think that that was something that all three of them kind of had to come to terms with. Ultimately, you just have to make a decision and go from there and trust that you'll get enough of the people behind you. And obviously, they were at least in part successful in that. Right. Well, um, what you're alluding to is what's called by historians the quid schism, right? So you have people in the Republican Party who are real sticklers for the limited government, open government, completely decentralized model that the Republicans had stood for when they were in opposition in the 1790s. And once they took power, they had to exercise power in the federal government. And this was bound to leave some people among their own coalition uh, discontented. Just as Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe were from Virginia, so the leading quids were from Virginia. And some of them were convinced that Madison had completely corrupted Jefferson. That was the conclusion they arrived at. Monroe, for a while, was one of those people. He was their hope. They thought that he could succeed Jefferson in the White House, or at least be the face on a movement to push Madison out. They always thought that if there were exercises of government authority that they thought were too forceful, too energetic, too prone to making the government more centralized during this period than it was Madison's influence that was leading to this. So they they early on arrived at the idea, well, Jefferson is a Jeffersonian, but Madison we're not sure of. And over time, they became more and more unsure of that. Yeah. And and it's interesting. We see kind of parallels with this idea. And, you know, Jefferson and Madison were some of those during the Washington presidency saying that, oh, well, Hamilton is influencing Washington. He has this undue influence. He's changing him from his true Republican beliefs. And then, you know, you get into the Jefferson presidency and you have this playing out with Madison, kind of the same thing. And it's it's right. really fascinating that that it just keeps going. <laughs> yes, there actually, of course, there was a, a reason why Monroe ended up for a while being the face of the quid movement. And that was that in 1806 and 7, he and William Pinckney negotiated a treaty with the British that would have put to rest most of the Americans' quarrels with British trade policy and the British uh, habit of impressing American sailor, sailors from American ships into the British Navy and so on. And when Jefferson saw it, he didn't approve it. Monroe thought the reason this had happened 
was that Jefferson didn't want to put another feather in Monroe's cap, just as the question who was going to succeed Jefferson was coming up. He thought, and most everybody knew, that Jefferson wanted Madison to be his successor. And Monroe believed that the reason why there continued to be problems with the British well into the Madison administration was that Jefferson had not submitted his and Pinckney's treaty to the Senate. So uh, whether that's a reasonable way of reading this, I, I think Monroe was wrong about. Jefferson had told him, look, the sine qua non of an acceptable treaty is there has to be an end of impressment. There has to be an end of this British custom of stopping American ships, interrogating the sailors, deciding one or another of them was British and forcing them on the spot into the Royal Navy. This had to stop, Jefferson said. We won't accept any treaty that doesn't include an end to this. And essentially, Pinckney and Monroe got everything else they could have wanted from the British, but they didn't get that. And so Jefferson rather insultingly wrote back to Mad- I mean, to Monroe and said, it looks here as if the British got everything they wanted. And if you were James Monroe, you were apt to be insulted because that was, <laughs> first of all, it sounded as if you were just incompetent. Secondly, it was untrue. Yeah. So there, there was a kind of opening for Monroe to be the face on an opposition. And for a while, he was on the outs with Jefferson and Madison. Finally, Jefferson wrote to him and said, essentially, look, your new, your new friends are leading you in a bad direction. And you're not going to like the way this works out. So you might want to think about some kind of rapprochement. And there ended up being one. And when, J- when John Randolph of Roanoke, one of the most colorful people in the book and in American history, heard about this, he, uh, he wrote the night he heard about it that, uh, let's see, what did the, en- the entry said? Uh, Richmond gave the date, James Monroe, traitor. That was his entire diary <laughs> entry. So, so again, th- these people, the quits, Randolph, John Taylor of Caroline, there were several others, mostly Virginians were actually more Catholic than the Pope. They were more Jeffersonian than Jefferson. They were still following the the party talk they had been instrumental in issuing in in the Federalist period. And now they saw their guy, Jefferson, he was still ideological in a way that ended up being harmful to the country, I think, in some senses. But he was not he was not doing exactly what they hoped they had hoped he would do. So they were unhappy with him. And they blamed Madison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting, you know, that that period that Monroe is kind of on the outs with especially Madison, but in some ways Jefferson as well. And I think it speaks to, you know, that there are it seems like there are some subtle differences in them. They they ultimately mostly agree, but you know, they have those periods where they're in conflict. And so let's just kind of turning to Monroe for a moment since, you know, we've just really started diving into him, but haven't gotten to his presidency yet in the podcast. So as Monroe started making inroads towards the presidency, you noted that he wrote about quote, the possibility of an America without political parties. And you talked about that, you know, in the 1820 election at that point, there was only one person who voted against him in the electoral college. So what vision do you think James Monroe had for the United States? And how did that compare and contrast to the vision that Thomas Jefferson had for America? Oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure that it's in significant contrast with Jefferson's. He thought that just as Jefferson did and just as Jefferson had laid out in that first inaugural address, he thought the federal government should have a limited role. It should have a limited effect on people. In general, if you didn't encounter a postmaster in most of the country, you weren't going to see the federal government. And Monroe thought that was perfectly fine. That was the way things should be. Government should be as decentralized as practicable. So he, Monroe was a Jeffersonian in a sense. The difference is, I think, among the three of these people, insofar as there is a, an ideological difference, Madison is the one who's a little bit different. Because as I explained in my previous book, James Madison and the Making of America, Madison had gone to the Philadelphia Convention with the idea of constructing a federal constitution that was more centralized, that gave more power to the federal government than than the one that the Philadelphia Convention produced. 
So he was less apt to be annoyed with, for example, a bank or internal federal internal improvements or a more active role for the federal government in various senses or having a bigger army or paying for more ships to be in the Navy. Madison was more pragmatic, I think, than the other two. Not to say that he was not also ideological to the point of, well, you'd have to say irresponsibility. We'll get to that, I guess. But so back to your question about Monroe. Monroe, I think, was a Jeffersonian. He believed that the government should, the federal union should get by with virtually no military on a regular basis, thereby having no imperative to tax people very much, if at all. And that to some extent, the economy would develop best if it were left to develop on its own. And so Monroe was not one who was going to be proposing uh, energetic measures by the federal government. And he, um, Monroe, we don't have, I think, any commentary from him about the embargo at the end of the Jefferson administration. I actually think the embargo was Madison's, had been Madison's brainchild as early as the early 1780s. And that you could see as a Jeffersonian measure to avoid taxing to pay for a military. On the other hand, you could see, you could also see it as an active government measure to try to tamp down what might have been seen as natural trade relations between Americans and especially people in the British Empire, but people in Europe in general. So um, there is distinction to be made among the three. Another distinction, of course, one that Secretary, uh, former Secretary of, of War during the Monroe administration, John C. Calhoun, put his finger on. He, in retrospect, he described Monroe, he said of Monroe, well, he wasn't brilliant, which anybody considering these three together would notice. But he said he had very good judgment. So you could say, well, Jefferson was brilliant, but the idea, and Madison was brilliant, but the idea that you would first essentially abolish the Navy, strip back the army to nothing, and then declare war on Britain, that was just, (laughs) how can you even describe it? So um, I don't think Monroe would have done that. And uh, anyway, that's what Calhoun was getting at. Monroe had good judgment. And the way that policymaking worked in all three of these administrations was that there would be cabinet meetings with the president presiding, and the president would lay out whatever policy question he wanted the cabinet to consider, and then the cabinet members would consider it in reverse order of seniority. So starting with the attorney general, he'd get his opinion, and the, they would talk about whatever the question was. And then Jefferson said he didn't think they'd had a serious argument in his entire eight years, which on one hand you could read as an old man remembering things through rose-colored glasses, right? Seeing things maybe in a happier light than they should have been seen in. But on the other hand, uh, Madison and Gallatin, the other chief player in in Jefferson's cabinet, were not argumentative types. So, and, And they did generally agree with Jefferson about more or less any political question you wanted to come up with. On the other hand, the Monroe administration was headed by this this fellow who had been in the Continental Army during the war. Of course, both Jefferson and Madison had exemplary educations and very finely honed intellects. James Monroe, who knows what his IQ was, but he was 18 in 1776. So like several of his classmates, he dropped out of William & Mary to go join the army. And then he never made up that defect in his upbringing. And so in his administration, there was a particularly large role for Secretary of State John Quincy Adams and Secretary of War Calhoun to lay out policy judgments, which uh, maybe this is why Calhoun thought that he had good judgment, which he tended to accept uh, after some refinement in the course of arguing about them in the in the uh, cabinet and in general, they made very good, uh, they proffered very good advice and Monroe tended to take it. And I think I didn't realize this when I began this project, but I think his administration certainly was one of the half dozen most successful presidential administrations. It, it clearly was the most successful of these three. Well, and, and it's interesting because you, you know, so much is talked about with Washington's cabinet and especially his initial cabinet that. Washington kind of had this realization. He knew 
what his strengths were and he knew where he needed support from his cabinet members. He needed strong members in his cabinet to be able to really have the administration, have the presidency function as it should in various matters, you know, the treasury, Mm -hmm. the foreign relations. And so you kind of see that with Monroe as well. And so kind of turning to that for a moment, because All three of these presidents at one point had a close working relationship with Washington and were able to observe his leadership style and approach. So in the course of your research, how did Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe respectively as president either adopt and or adapt some of the precedents set by Washington? Well, when I talk about the Washington administration with my undergraduates, I make a point of noting the many precedents that Washington established that are still followed. There are several things that Washington did that are not in the Constitution that we now see as obligatory. For example, giving inaugural addresses. That's not in the Constitution. Um, having a cabinet. That's not really in the Constitution. But Mad- I'm sorry, Washington, after the pattern of his generalship, that which involved having discussions among the officers and making strategy decisions and that kind of thing, decided that there should be a cabinet, should have regular meetings, they should discuss the leading political questions, and then he would uh, make decisions uh, on the basis of the advice he was given. Jefferson, of course, having been, in theory at least, the leading officer in the cabinet in Washington's first administration and into his second one, decided to follow this model. So the thing is, though, Jefferson knew before he chose the people who were going to be in his cabinet what their political leanings were, and he did not end up with the kind of division you had in Washington's administration. One thing to notice about that, of course, is, as Friend noted in his book, Founding Friendship, most of the choosing of cabinet officials for the Washington administration was done with Madison's advice. So it was Madison who had the idea, for example, I think he was the third choice to choose Hamilton to be Treasury Secretary, right, which ended up being, it ended up working out in a way that Madison, I think, had not anticipated, it's fair to say. Um, but anyway, the, the, so the model of Washington's cabinet deliberations, this was your actual question, uh, the model of Washington's cabinet deliberations is one that Jefferson decided to follow. We'll we'll hear from people in reverse order of seniority, and we'll we'll kind of root things out. But um, in his autobiography, which he wrote in his seventies, Jefferson said there had never been a serious di- serious disagreement in his cabinet. Well, that was not like Hamilton Hamilton and Jefferson, um, Knox and and uh, Randolph at all. And perhaps it would have been useful if there had been somebody taking the other side. Um, I hinted before that I thought the uh, military policy that the first two of these three fellows followed, you know, it ended up being ruinous to the point of irresponsible, I think. So that's one thing that was different. But of course, Jefferson followed Washington's example in giving an inaugural address, in sending annual messages on the State of the Union to Congress, in essentially running cabinet deliberations in the same way as Washington had. Uh, I'm sure there are other things that aren't coming to mind, but people believe that Washington's example should be followed. Yeah. And and it's interesting because you see like with Jefferson's presidency, there are certain things like his style of entertaining, of course, is is different than under Washington and Adams. And you start to see some of that coming back in the Madison and Monroe administrations, more of an emphasis on these social events as part of the larger political male you at the time. And likewise, you know, you see Washington, the example of Washington going on the the national tours and Monroe kind of brings that back. Right. I was actually going to mention that. It really does seem like, it, it does seem like there's at least starting to get back to, and it's interesting because it also comes around the time that um, the Marquis de Lafayette came back to America and kind of this thinking of that past of the early Republic, this time that, you know, is starting to pass. All these folks are either 
going or gone from the Constitutional Convention. Right. Well, there are really touching scenes in my book in which the old war hero, and Monroe was an authentic war hero, like like Washington, actually. Uh, the old war hero shows up at some little town in Indiana and meets vet encounters veterans, and sometimes he'd recognize these people. There's one there's one instance in which uh, I think he was in New Hampshire, actually, where he was supposed to be welcomed by. I'm going to get the details wrong now, but I think he was supposed to be welcomed by the president of Dartmouth College, who wasn't there, or and but he ended up talking to the that man's wife, and it turned out that that man's wife, that is the, the Dartmouth president's wife, had been the woman who nursed him while he was bedridden from his his wounds at Trenton. And so the two of them talked about this. They had neither of them had I mean, Monroe had not known this was going to happen, but apparently there was just a hush in this big room while the two of them are becoming reacquainted. And that's uh, that's one that's <laughs> that's what Monroe th- hoped. Not that he wanted to buttress his own standing, but he hoped that his traveling around the country, which he did on these three tours of the three major regions of the country would remind people that although they never saw the federal government, it's kind of hard to imagine, although they never saw the federal government, it was working for them. It was responsible to them. Here he was their president. Here he was, you know, riding in a carriage in in untracked land for days on end just to come to some little town with 400 residents and say, hello, I'm your president. And, you know, he thought this had a a very important uh, function that is reminding people in a Republican society that ultimately they were the rulers. And he, so he had this idea, which Jefferson had expressed in his first inaugural address, where all Republicans were all Federalists. He had this idea that the party division had had undermined people's, I don't know, affection for the country, or certainly Jefferson said in his first inaugural address, affection for each other. And if we undertook these tours, why we might remind people you know, that they're all at root, they're Americans. They're not necessarily Federalists or Republicans, they're just Americans. This is a common identity. It's a common government. It, they have common political principles. Those are what really matter. So that idea is one that Monroe shared with Jefferson. Of course, Madison had said in the Federalist that in a, a complex society, par- parties were more or less inevitable. One 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 uh, kind of uh, conceit we have now in American discussion of politics or political science is that these people were all reading the Federalist all the time, right? So they all they all took their <laughs> that reflected their views. But notice in the Federalist, Madison said the party was essentially inevitable. If you had a if you had a complex society, people were going to align with their own prominent figures or their own religious beliefs or their own their own economic sectors or whatever. And James Monroe did not believe that. Thomas Jefferson didn't believe that. Not in the way that uh, Madison said it. So one effect of reading my book, I think, should be to undercut the the purchase on people's minds that the Federalist has. It was a a topical newspaper series. It was not something everybody had studied in eighth grade the way it is now. Everybody didn't have a copy right there to refer to go. every five minutes. So That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, and it's fascinating. One of the things that I think is most fascinating about your work with the Jeffersonians, and I think one of the, the biggest takeaways from this for readers, is this idea of you know these three men, even beyond just the near quarter century that one of them was president, you know, even for decades more, they were in interaction with one another and they were learning from one another and talking to one another. And a couple of the moments that really stood out to me is when you discussed Madison's critique of Monroe's inaugural address, and then President Monroe consulting with Jefferson and Madison about foreign relation matters with Great Britain in 1821. You know, even at this point, you know, Jefferson had been out of office for a while. Madison had just left office. But here the president is going back to his predecessors and asking for advice and getting 
critique and advice. Right. And so as you know, first Madison and then Monroe succeeded to the presidency, what impressions do you get about how each approached their predecessors? And likewise, how did these former presidents feel about their successors approach to the presidency? Oh, boy. Well, one thing, to, the first thing that comes to mind on hearing that question is that at the very end of his presidency, Jefferson just kind of dropped out. He went home to Monticello. Eventually, he got a note from Secretary of State Madison and Secretary of Treasury Gallatin saying, here are some problem areas. We need you to come back to Washington to, to work your way through. We'd like to talk about them with you. And Jefferson wrote back to them and said, essentially, well, I think this is going to be some, these are going to be things that are going to weigh on my successors. So I don't think I should preempt them in decision making. Basically, he's saying, look, fellas, these are your problems. I think I'll stay back here at Monticello. And um, on the other hand, when it came to especially Monroe writing them and asking their opinions about things like the British offer to interdict other European powers attempts to recolonize former parts of the Spanish Empire in the Western Hemisphere, Jefferson was willing to give him his advice, and so was Madison. And the, the same, actually, it's kind of interesting. When, when Monroe asked Jefferson questions, they tended to be about things like foreign policy. When he asked Madison questions, they were about things like the Constitution. So there were other, you know, that's not a, that's not a firm rule. But he did think that he was uh, that he kind of had an unwritten permission to, that is Monroe did, that he had kind of unwritten permission to inquire of them. And of course, Jefferson was not averse to roping them into his efforts. And I tell the story of his uh, corralling Madison and Monroe into attending the ground laying of the first building on the central grounds at UVA. And he actually told Monroe, I think if you were there and so was Madison, this would make a uh, great impression on the public. And in other words, we would say, now this is a PR stunt, right? And it was a PR stunt, but it, he was right that the fact that all three of them were in attendance meant the news of UVA's being, uh, the ground, of ground being broken was heard all over the country, just as Jefferson hoped. So, the, the, and besides that, of course, the three of them remain close friends. And if you go to Monticello today, for example, you'll see one room is called the Madison Room because that's where Mr. and Mrs. Madison stayed whenever they visited, which was a common occurrence. And um, I think, too, that although there was that period after Jefferson decided not to submit the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty to the Senate when Jefferson, I mean, when Madison and Monroe were on the outs, the two of them ended up being friendly um, at the end of their lives, too. So that is one major part of the story. Is the three of them are the closest. Any two of them, any two of them, would be the closest friends who've ever been president, right? So all three of them are close, and they're close in political principles. They're close in upbringing. They're close in their policy uh, formulation. Uh, really, it's hard to distinguish among them very much, except in the ways we've already done in this conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Monroe, I think, is more realistic about the military issue, right? And, of course, that comes from the fact that he's he's been in the Army. He was a professional soldier. He, he knew what was up, and he probably thought this is not going to work out well. I show the, the just completely farcical role that President Madison played at the Bladensburg uh, I want to say races at the Battle of Bladensburg. You wouldn't have expected Matt Monroe to do that. And so there are distinctions to be made among them, but it's more or less one continuous administration. One symbol of that is that Gallatin, who becomes Treasury Secretary at the beginning of the Jefferson administration, is Treasury Secretary virtually to the end of Madison's first term. So he is today still the longest serving major cabinet officer in American history. He was Treasury Secretary for more than 11 years. And if Madison had had his way, he would have been Secretary of State, I guess, for Madison's whole administration. So it's just, uh, to borrow from Hamilton in another context, it's pork still with a change of the sauce, right? It's, it's just <laughs> really one fellow thinking. Yeah. Well, and, and it's fascinating. And the Gallatin story is especially one that I've always encourage folks to learn more about Gallatin because he he's 
he doesn't get as much attention as Hamilton, but I would argue that he had a near equal influence on things. But the fact that (laughs) Madison tried to keep him as treasury secretary, even when he was sending him to Europe as a diplomat, And right. finally, Congress forced his hand. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have just kept him on as Treasury Secretary in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, uh, and of course, he ends up negotiating a very favorable, in light of the military situation during the War of 1812, a very favorable outcome, which was the restoration of the status quo antebellum. Essentially, the, the British had occupied the northern part of New England, and they just gave it back. They didn't need to give it back. We weren't going to be able to make them give it back. But they did because I Galton yeah. talked them into it. Yeah. Yeah, that that was really the best possible outcome and and I don't know that many expected it to be to end up that way. Right. 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 Well, and it's interesting because this, you know, these twenty four years that these three men are president. You know, it is such a pivotal time. You're starting to see the nation change. And likewise, you know, looking back and starting to think through what the history of the early republic is, was, and will be, you know, you have folks starting to think about the history of this time. And Mm -hmm. you note in your work that, quote, Jefferson at the beginning of his intellectual life thought historical study a pointless diversion. But by 1802, he changed his mind (laughs) because you're starting to see those works coming out about the life of George Washington. And, you know, they're starting to debate Washington's legacy and what all of this meant and the revolution. And so (laughs) Jefferson starts to change his mind on that. Maybe it is important. And so I wanted to see, Kevin, in the course of your research, what impression did you get about how the three Jeffersonian presidents viewed the importance of controlling and shaping the historical narrative? Well, we know certainly that Jefferson and Madison both gave this serious attention. Jefferson tried to recruit a Republican ally to write a history of the early Republic back from the Washington administration. And uh, Joel Barlow from uh, what's now Reading, Connecticut, which is about, I guess, eight miles from where I'm standing, um, but Barlow wouldn't do it, even though he, Jefferson had told him, look, you'll have access to all the public documents, Madison's record of the Philadelphia Convention. I have tons of political correspondence. What more could you want? And this was all supposed to be an offset to John Marshall's very slanted ongoing history of or ongoing biography of Washington, which was based largely on Hamilton's papers. But he failed to get this done. Uh, Madison, for his part, when he was in retirement, received communications from different people who had undertaken to write histories of the Revolution and early Republic. And he, Madison, gave them lots of information. Actually, there's also the most, what was in the 19th century, the most famous biography of Patrick Henry was largely a rehash of a memo that Jefferson had written to the author, William Wirt saying what a sluggard Henry was and wow, what a demagogue. And it was just a totally skewed version of Henry's life that was really unfair to him. But that's what, that's what work got from Jefferson. So he just kind of relayed that and told people, I'm not really very happy with this biography, but because Henry didn't save his papers, I can't, I can't really have him speaking. I have to have Jefferson speaking and Jefferson by the end of, it, of Henry's life, it was on the outs with Jefferson. I mean, with Henry. So anyway, Madison got these these queries from various people who were writing histories, and he helped them as much as he could. He got critical queries about his own exi- his own administration, and he didn't deny that it was highly flawed, and tried to explain why that was or um, why it had been, I should say. So this was something that they thought was important. They thought that people weren't going to understand what the revolution had been about. Famously, Jefferson and his friend and enemy, then friend again, John Adams, commiserated about the idea that nobody would really be able to write a true history of the American Revolution. And so they were going to, especially Madison in this case, was going to contribute as much as he could to making the record clear. 
But there was, in the 19th century, no Republican answer to John Marshall's life of Washington. So that had a big role in kind of laying down the markers for people's descriptions of the early republic. Even though it's not a very well-written book, and uh, this is not a partisan position, Marshall didn't think it was a well-written book. Still, it's full of primary material from Washington's own pen, so people relied on it. And Jefferson realized that was going to happen, but as I said, he failed to recruit someone to write a Republican answer to it. And Jefferson actually had thought, he had told young men earlier in his life that, you know, studying history, it's not really that useful. You should worry about it. And he named some practical things. But then as he got older, he thought, well, people need to study history so they'll understand what kind of flaws crop, crop up in Republican societies and what kinds of developments can lead to the ends of republics, which down to the founding of the American Republic had always been short-lived. So people thought this is a perishable kind of government we have, and there needs to be effort taken to ensure that it's got some kind of stability. And Jefferson wanted to contribute to that, even though I don't think he really contributed that much to that. And Monroe, um, people didn't, uh, I don't think there's the same kind of attention from him to this question. But he he was not like the other two in that he had not been at the highest levels of politics for most of the revolution. He was after that. But during the revolution itself, he was, you know, in the war, in the army. So he couldn't give the same kind of uh, feedback about creating state constitutions or writing the Declaration of Independence and negotiating with the French, those kinds of things that the other two could. Well, and, and that's how, what I always tell folks when they're studying history. It's important not just to engage with a source, whether it's primary or secondary, but also, and especially with secondary sources, know who's writing it and why. Because right. you know, to your point with John Marshall's account of Washington, it was done intentionally with a political slant to it. And the fact that that was what was available for so long helped to shape future histories because folks would start to engage with that. And it's always important to read things with a grain of salt because there may be new information. There may be new sources that come up that help us to rethink and see things in a different light. And, and that's, that's the wonderful thing about history, but it's also, it speaks to the power that history can have for better or worse. Right, right. Well, William Wirt did not intend for his book about Henry to be critical, but Henry is one of the few prominent figures in this period who did not save his correspondence. We don't know why he didn't. So f famously, we have over 30,000 documents in, in Thomas Jefferson's handwriting, but for Henry, there's very, very little. And that meant that Word ended up relying on Jefferson's essentially character assassination in what became the most popular book about Henry in the 19th century. Absolutely. Well, and kind of thinking about the work that you've done, the, the research that you've engaged in with Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, what was the most surprising thing that you learned about these three presidents or about their three presidencies? And was your general understanding of any of the three altered through this work? And that could be for better or worse. Well, I came to the clear conclusion that Monroe's was the most successful of the three administrations. It seems that in a diplomatic sense, domestically, you'd have to say that Monroe's administration was one of the handful of most successful presidential administrations in American history. I did not realize that before I began doing the work for this book. So that's one thing. Another thing that was kind of interesting, it was it's a small point, but when Monroe was on those three tours of different regions of the country that we mentioned earlier, the receptions tended to be more or less the same. He'd be met by a local committee of outstanding citizens, and they'd, one of them would read him a statement, and then he'd read them an answer, and then there'd be some kind of dinner with the with the aristocrat local aristocrats, and there'd be there'd be uh, toasts. And one thing that surprised me, and here we're talking about, uh, I guess this is about thirty 
30 years after Ben Franklin's death. Among people they, and causes they would toast would be Ben Franklin. So the, Washington was always among the toasts. And Ben Franklin was the next most common person. I had no idea that he was uh, somebody who had so much purchase on the American uh, affections through the first part of the 19th century. So that was that's, you know, probably trivial, but it's something that stood out to me. I found it surprising. That another thing that's important about this period is, of course, there's ongoing conflict between the Republicans and the federal courts. And I part of my training is in law, so this is of particular interest to me. But at the time, it was of particular interest to Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe that they were constantly butting heads with John Marshall, Jefferson's cousin. And um, even though the Republicans are winning all the elections and We've said before that by the end of this period, the Federalist Party has literally ceased to exist. Still, John Marshall and his colleagues are writing Hamiltonianism into constitutional law. So today, if you take, if you study constitutional law in a push or as an undergraduate or you go to law school, you start with Marbury versus Madison, which the holding of which was not controversial. That is, the Republicans did not oppose judicial review. What they didn't like was the political lecture before they got to that part of the opinion in Marbury versus Madison. But then um, next comes McCulloch versus Maryland, which is essentially Alexander Hamilton's view about the powers of Congress, the extent of congressional power. And there were several other cases like this in which Marshall and his colleagues just wrote Hamiltonianism into what we now call constitutional law. So even though the Republicans are winning all the elections, there's nothing they can do about this. And Jefferson, by the end of the book, is just bewailing this. And there are various other prominent people in Virginia, Senator John Taylor of Caroline, uh, Spencer Roan, who's the head of what's now called the Virginia Supreme Court. Um, other people are complaining. And Jefferson says it's the great flaw in the Constitution that there's no way the, the people can correct the judges. So we... We still live with a situation in which uh, the starting point for uh, understanding powers of Congress is Alexander Hamilton's view of powers of Congress, even though, again, the voters voted the Federalist Party into non-existence. They did not agree with that. So that's that's an interesting uh, sub-theme, I think, or maybe it's a theme in the book. It doesn't run through the whole book, but it's it comes up again and again, kind of an interesting point, I think. And another thing that that brings to mind is when Jefferson, of course, when he took the oath of office, he took it from his cousin, the chief justice, and then he appointed his best friend, secretary of state. And the first time he had, oh, and the, the House majority leader was another Jefferson cousin. And the first time Jefferson had a chance to appoint somebody to the Supreme Court, he chose John Blair, who was from Albemarle County, Jefferson's home county. So it's hard to, it would be hard to exaggerate the extent to which this was a small group running the country, right? Not only does not only is Madison, the Secretary of State, Jefferson's best friend, but Dolly Madison has three cousins or in-laws in Congress and one on the Supreme Court. So if you wanted to draw a kind of a diagram of the relationships among these people, it would just look like a, uh, I don't know, it looked like a ball of wool, a ball of yarn, right? It's just a small, <laughs> small group. Very aristocratic. Absolutely. And, and it's just so fascinating, you know, that relationships in politics are always important to study, but especially like at this time period where you do have so many of those close relations in the government and interacting with one another and, and sometimes being in opposition to one another. It's just, it's so fascinating. And I know presidencies listeners know that I like to go kind of beyond just the president and think of some of the other folks who were major players at that time that we may not know quite as much about, but, you know, are still players because at the time that was, that was key, you know, and having those folks in Congress who could act on your behalf or knowing that you were opposing your cousin, it, it just, it was part of the fabric of the time. Yeah, and there actually was an ethic among Virginian elite people that you should be in government. So at one point, James Monroe writes to a friend of his, former U.S. Senator John Taylor of Carolina, I mentioned him before, who's 
again, been a senator, but he's out of office at this point. Uh, Monroe writes to him and says, essentially, look, you have a lot of money. You're healthy. Why are you retired? Like, you should be back in government. What are you doing? And within a trice, uh, Taylor's back in the Senate. So people, they just, this Virginian group had its own peculiar political uh, culture. And one aspect of it was that people who had money to do it should be in politics, which I think is totally unlike today, right? We don't expect, I'm sure my state, I live in Connecticut. I'm sure my state legislature does not have any of the leading people in society in Connecticut, you know, in the lower house of the legislature. That's just not the way it works. But in Virginia, in this period, that's who was in the lower house of the legislature. And they would choose people from among their number to be, of course, in those days before the 17th Amendment, they chose the U.S. senators, the state legislature did. They would choose similar people to be in the U.S. Senate. So um, that meant that all these people were closely allied, were had been educated more or less in the same way. Most of them, peculiar exceptions like Madison, but most of them had gone to William and Mary. Most of them were related over and over again. It's it's an odd thing compared to today's society. Absolutely, and we we start to see, you know, as we get into the Monroe presidency and start to move forward from there, you know, once you get out of the Jeffersonian presidents, some of this starts to change, you know, that influence that Virginia had on the national political scene starts to change some, but and you start to have these new figures come up. And so as we close out our conversation, I want to bring us to a couple of those folks because we've heard so much about that relationship between Clay Webster and Calhoun as the great triumvirate. But would you mind talking about the relationship between John Quincy Adams and John C. Calhoun, particularly while both were serving in Monroe's cabinet, and what impact this relationship had on both men in their respective careers? Because you know they would go from the Monroe cabinet and be major leaders on the national scene for you know, decades to come. Well, I think they're the they're the main people responsible for the considerable success of Monroe's administration. I, I think it's fair to say that John Quincy Adams is the most important Secretary of State in American history, and Calhoun was the leading War Secretary of the nineteenth century. That Calhoun was responsible in the cabinet and in the Congress for that is through his allies in Congress for creation of the of the general staff. There had been essentially no War Department when he became War Secretary, and the people who had held the office before him, except for Monroe, who was briefly War Secretary, in general had been nobodies, right? It was seen as kind of second-rank cabinet position. It wasn't anything like being Secretary of State or or uh, Secretary of Treasury. But Calhoun made the American military into a professional military. And this was to some extent against the Jefferson and Madison idea that, well, we should only be paying for a military when we're in a war, right? So the War of 1812, if it had proven anything had proved, you needed to have some kind of regular military establishment. And Calhoun was the man responsible for getting Congress, well, of course, under Monroe's name, but he, he was the man responsible for getting Congress to create the American military. And in fact, the most recent biographer of Calhoun says when the Civil War came, the South had Calhoun's ideas and the North had his army. And this was true. This is true. He essentially, insofar as an executive official can be credited with legislation, he created the American military. On the other hand, uh, Adams is responsible for the Transcontinental Treaty, which made the United States a transcontinental country. Even after the Louisiana Purchase, people in Europe were already saying, well, obviously, eventually the United States are going to be a great power. But once the United States was a transcontinental country, there was no denying not only was it going to be a great power, it was going to be among the handful of great powers. And Adams is chiefly responsible for this. The two of them are also, uh, well, uh, I tell the story in the book of the way that Florida ended up changing hands between the Spanish and and the United States. And that was a brilliant, because of a brilliant insight of Adams. The short version is that uh, Andrew Jackson was insubordinate in in Florida. And Calhoun, the war secretary, his immediate superior, wanted him to be relieved of his office. And in the cabinet, Adams' answer to that was, well, it's true. We don't want 
American generals to go off against their orders and start wars with great European powers. On the other hand, we can make use of this. So what they did was they essentially sent a letter to the king of Spain saying, well, you know, we didn't want our general to conquer Florida, but he did. And you've seen how easy it was. So would you like us to pay you for Florida? Of course, the implication was or not. (laughs) And the king of Spain communicated with other major European countries. Are are we going to let the Americans get away with this? And none of them sympathized with Spain. So the United States ended up buying Spain, right? This was John Quincy Adams' insight that this could work out this way. Um, There are several other points during the Monroe administration when this kind of thing happens. One or the other, Calhoun and Adams have these kinds of insights, give Monroe good advice. Uh, One example for Calhoun, another example for Calhoun is when the Missouri controversy is going on, there um, first there is word from Monroe's chief political advisor, his son-in-law, George Hay, who's a, a lawyer in Richmond, that people here are saying that if you go along with legislation that will prevent Missouri from coming into the union with slavery, that the General Assembly will not renominate you for president. So what are we going to do about this? Well, Calhoun's um, advice to Monroe was the most important thing about the Missouri controversy is to get it over with, because this could be the end of the union. And what ends up happening is, of course, Monroe signs off on the Missouri Compromise, which lets in all of Louisiana with slavery excluded except for Missouri, essentially. And when he hears about this, John Randolph of Roanoke, Jefferson's cousin, former House Majority Leader, says, well, that's it. That's the end of it. That means an end of slavery, because these states are all going to elect senators. They're going to come to Washington. They'll vote for an amendment about abolishing slavery, and that'll be the end of slavery. I think Monroe, I know Monroe knew this, right? So I show at the beginning of the book that um, just as Jefferson is winning the election, or Jefferson and Burr are defeating the Federalists in the election of 1800, there occurred in the area around Richmond, what we think is the biggest slave conspiracy in American history, and its target was Monroe. What they intended to do was depending on whom you believe, there are between 350 and 1,000 slave men involved in this conspiracy all the way from Richmond down to, down to the coast on the James. But what, the, what they intended to do was to grab Monroe and then use him as a hostage and negotiate the end of slavery in Virginia. Of course, that wouldn't have happened even if they had grabbed Monroe. But Monroe ends up, after there have been several trials and hangings, and he's pardoned some people, and some of them have been acquitted, he writes to his patron, Vice President Jefferson, and he says, I don't know what to do about this. Um, I don't like the way things are going. And Jefferson writes back and says, in the area around Char- in the area around uh, Monticello, we have the feeling there have been hangings enough. And the, the two of them end up agreeing. First of all, they agree. Jefferson says, we have to treat these men as criminals. The implication is that they're not criminals, but, you know, they, want to, they don't want to be slaves, but we have to treat them as criminals. And the editor of Monroe's paper says this series of letters back and forth is the first known time that James Monroe says, I look forward to the day when there's no slavery in Virginia. So then what they go on about is, well, okay, so what can we do with these people? And they have the idea, (laughs) Jefferson says, well, you know, we could find a a Caribbean uh, island to send them to. People there would think they would be, think of them as heroes. If If we were people there, we'd think they were heroes. They'd be good citizens. And so you, the, the picture you get of, of Monroe and Jefferson is it's like scorpions in a bottle, right? What can we do about this? We can't, obviously, if you're the governor of Virginia, you can't declare the end of slavery. You don't have authority to declare the end of slavery. You might think, well, I wouldn't be involved in it. If I were James Monroe, I'd resign. But what would that do? He, as I said, he'd already pardoned people, right? Somebody else might not have pardoned anybody, right? So it's not necessarily better for the slaves for James Monroe to resign. So the, the point is, at the beginning of the book, they're already thinking, what can we do about this? And then we get to the the second term of Monroe's administration. He's signing off on the Missouri Compromise, which means the end of slavery. And there, and of course, ultimately, it does mean the end of slavery. Lincoln says, I'm going to enforce the Missouri Compromise. And the South says, we're seceding. And he says, no, you're not. And that, that, so this was about Monroe's signing the, off on the Missouri Compromise. That's what the Civil War was about. The South seceded because Lincoln was going to enforce the Missouri Compromise. Um, when Jefferson 
uh, was president. He, in his 1806 State of the Union message, which, of course, in those days was a written message, said, the Constitution says, you can't ban the, imp-, he's addressing Congress. He says, the Constitution says you can't ban importation of slaves until 1808. So uh, why don't you do that in 1807? Pass a bill, I'll sign it. It can go into effect at the earliest constitutional moment. So that's what happened. And people hear this and they think, well, how important is that? In the previous three years, that is in the three years immediately before 1808, South Carolina alone imported 70,000 people to be slaves in the United States. And this meant it stopped. We, as far as we know, there was exceedingly little um, smuggling of black people into America to be slaves after 1807. Right? It just didn't happen. So Jefferson calling for this and then signing off on it meant significantly fewer people were slaves in America than would have been. And there are other points in the book when we see them Jefferson, Madison, or Monroe, or two of them in concert, uh, doing things that were important uh, blows to slavery. It happens over and over, and the three of them all agree slavery has to go. It's going to go. Um, If you were an important politician in Virginia, as I said before, Hay is warning Monroe, you can't just sign off on exclusion of slavery from Missouri, or they'll just they won't renominate you for president. We'll get with that, dude. So they ha- they can't <laughs> they can't say we want to abolish slavery, but they're doing things that are going to lead to the end of it, and they're doing things that mean fewer people will be slaves in America, and they're doing things to um, prepare public opinion for this too. So there have been recent in, in my book Thomas Jefferson Revolutionary, I show other steps Jefferson took against slavery and Monroe and Madison also very much disliked it. One last thing. Another theme in the book is that all three of them have the idea that American Indians should be incorporated into American society. So Jefferson famously in notes in the state of Virginia had, had repeated what was a kind of truism in the enlightenment that there was, there were stages of societal development. And he said, if you start in the West, you have the least developed. And as you approach our seaside cities, you have the most advanced kind of society. And he thinks, and Madison thinks, that American Indians would be better off if instead of being hunter-gatherers, they were sedentary farmers who were literate in English and involved in a market economy and so on. And uh, when Monroe is touring the country, he encourages people to donate money for this. He uh, visits Indian schools and encourages people to donate money to them. He calls on Congress to establish friendly trade relations with particular groups of Indians in the Midwest and the South, what was then the Southwest, now the South Central part of the country, I guess. So these, these are very important developments that I think people have kind of lost sight of. Nowadays, we hear a very Manichaean depiction of, you know, they're all terrible slave owners. Well, yes, they were all slave owners. For most of Jefferson's life, it was illegal to free a slave in Virginia. And if you did, eventually you'd have to deport him from Virginia, which meant he'd be away from everybody he knew. And he also couldn't do that because he was, he was essentially bankrupt. So if you freed a slave and you had any debt, your debtor could seize the slaves. It, It was just a more complicated picture than we are getting from the media these last I don't know, three or four years, but all three of them took significant steps against slavery and all three of them hoped for a happy future relationship between the American polity and American Indians. They really wanted that and they took steps in that direction too. So I think that's an important part of the book, or I guess there are two, these are two separate parts of the book. Well, and Kevin, I always like to invite guests to share with the audience kind of where your research is taking you and what they can be on the lookout from you next. And you had mentioned uh, before we started recording that you had alluded to that your research may be taking you into some of those figures in this post Jeffersonian era and, and going a little further into the story of American history prior to the civil war. So would you mind sharing with the audience kind of where your research is headed now? Well, this is the first time I've said this in public, but Uh, What I have in mind is an examination of the relationship between Calhoun and Quincy Adams. It's a very interesting and important one. The two of them, again, are the leading players in Monroe's presidency, which is the most successful of the first 
six presidencies. I think that's not even controversial. And I show in the book the point at which first uh, Adams has his first interactions with Calhoun in the cabinet, and he's effusively positive about him. And famously, Adams, in his just copious diaries, is only positive about people named Adams. But Calhoun's an exception. So he says very positive things about Calhoun's intellect and his education and the way he formulates opinions and, and that he always comes to the right conclusion. And then after a while, the two of them are walking home from the White House one day and they get to talking about slavery. And Calhoun says something like, well, you know, in South Carolina, because of the environment, there are just some, some kinds of labor that white men won't do. And so we have to have slavery. And uh, in his diary description of this, Adams says, this is just the way all these Southerners think. This is a perfect distillation of the way they think about these things. And he says, I think a career devoted to opposition to slavery would be a worthy career. And of course, we know that that's basically where John Quincy Adams ended up. He, he was, he was a, an unsuccessful president, partly because Calhoun was involved in founding the Democratic Party to oppose the Quincy Adams administration. So the, the Democratic Party comes to be, according to my uh, UVA mentor, um, Michael Holt, in a letter from uh, Martin Van Buren to Thomas Ritchie. So Van Buren's a senator from New York, and Ritchie is the editor of the most important paper, at least in the South, maybe in the whole country, the Richmond Inquirer. And Van Buren writes to Ritchie and says, Calhoun tells me I need to be in touch with you. And why? Because we're organizing opposition to the Adams administration. And Holt says, this is the birth of the Democratic Party right there. The reason it existed was to get Quincy Adams and Henry Clay out of the White House. And why? Well, because they were off on a, an anti-Jeffersonian tangent. They wanted to have a very active uh, federal government. And my book ends, my Jeffersonians ends with Jefferson's response to John Quincy Adams' inaugural address, which just has him apoplectic. And he can't, you know, how could it be that after all this, we end up with Hamiltonianism? That's what he's laid out. So they they organized the party, the Democratic Party, to oppose this. And Calhoun organizes the Senate to oppose John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams' allies say that the U.S. Senate, the first year of John Calhoun's vice presidency is the first parliamentary body ever in an English speaking country that's organized against the executive. Calhoun does this on purpose, right? So there are going to be, there, there are those two episodes between Quincy Adams and Calhoun, but there are going to be numerous others. Of course, the two of them become increasingly, well, Calhoun becomes increasingly important. Adams is not as important in himself, I think, but he is a leader in pushing abolitionism as a cause in a way that has him butting heads with Calhoun, who increasingly is defending slavery over and over. So I think that's a very interesting story. Each of them is very interesting in himself. And one, one thing I find appealing about working on them is they're both just brilliant, which makes my life more pleasant. So this is what I'm thinking will be my next project. My, uh, my agent likes it. I haven't run it by my editor yet, but we'll see. I hope I hope that's where I'm going next. Hopefully so, because I, as I said, you know, when we were talking before recording, you know, that was part of the reason that prompted me to ask a question about their relationship because I could just tell that you were starting to get interested. You could tell that this was this was a relationship that you were fascinated in. Even in the Jeffersonians, it's a small part of the book, but you know, it just seemed like there was something there. And so hopefully you will be able to move forward with that because that would be a fascinating read. And I think that it's something that isn't as well talked about, but it's important, like you said, to understand for where American history went post the Jeffersonian presidencies. Yes, I think so. Even today, it has an enormous legacy. So... Right, right. I hope so. Well, in the meantime, I cannot recommend our listeners enough to read The Jeffersonians, The Visionary Presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, 
Kevin, thank you so much for coming on Presidencies. Thank you so much for sharing your insight about these fascinating individuals and this fascinating time in the early Republic. This was an amazing read, and I hope that our listeners will go. And there is so much more to the story that we haven't had a chance to cover in this episode. So highly recommend them to check it out. But Kevin, thank you so much. You're entirely welcome. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much again to Kevin Gutzman for his time and the insight that he provided in this episode. The book is called The Jeffersonians, The Visionary Presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, and it's available anywhere good books can be found. You can learn more about Kevin through his website, which is Kevin Gutzman, and that's K-E-V-I-N-G-U-T-Z-M-A-N dot com. I'll have a link to it on the page for this episode on my website, which is Presidency's podcast, all one word, dot com. There, you can also find past episodes, links to resources on all the American presidents, and information on how you, yes, you, dear listener, can support the Presidency's podcast. A special thanks to all of our patrons, whose support helps to offset the cost of hosting and producing the podcast. If you'd like to reach out, please feel free to email me at Presidency's podcast, again, all one word, at gmail.com. Or, if you don't follow me on social media already, you can reach out through one of the many platforms I'm on. I'm on Facebook, Mastodon, and Post as Presidencies. On Twitter, or X if it's still that when you're listening, at Presidencies89. And on Instagram and threads at Presidencies Podcast. Again, all one word. Last, but certainly not least, I thank you so much for listening. Until next time, stay safe and healthy. Be kind to one another, and take care, dear friends. Hello, this is Gary Chahot welcoming you to check out the French History Podcast. Our main show covers the history of France from the first humans until present. If you liked Mike Duncan's The History of Rome and wanted a similar program covering the land of beauty, culture, and love, we are exactly that. We also host world-renowned scholars who have delivered guest episodes on their specialties, including 18th century pirates, revolutionary booksellers in 20th century Paris, the special friendship between the Marquis de Lafayette and Thomas Jefferson, and numerous others. Learn what you love and listen to the French History Podcast today.